Since ancient times, philosophers have seen it as the basis of all real achievement. This is the quality of courage. There's a book that tells the stories of all the winners of the Congressional Medal of Honor. It's a book that will bring tears to your eyes. It's one of the most powerful documents ever written. One American after another who put aside all thought of safety and faced down death in the service of this country. And more often than not, it's been in order to save other Americans rather than to defeat an enemy. When you read of their exploits, you realize that these were people who simply lost their fear of death in order to do what had to be done. Yes, those Medal of Honor winners were courageous individuals, but by itself, is overcoming the fear of death necessarily an expression of courage? I don't doubt that there are many people in this country who break the law and aren't afraid to die in the process, but I wouldn't call them courageous. And there are people who do deliberately foolhardy things with their cars that jeopardize their own lives and the lives of others, but they aren't courageous people. In fact, a hungry donkey will keep eating until his stomach bursts, even if you hit him with a stick trying to make him stop. He's overcome his fear all right, but he's obviously not courageous. We might not be able to precisely define it, but we intuitively sense that there are some differences between acts of rashness and the accomplishments of those winners of the Congressional Medal of Honor. Let me sum up in a couple of sentences what those differences reveal about the true nature of courage. I can't put it any better than the Greek philosopher Aristotle did more than 2,000 years ago. A truly courageous person is not someone who never feels fear, but who fears the right thing at the right time in the right way. What exactly does that mean? What does it mean to fear the right thing in the right way at the right time? To find the answer, let's look at some specific sources of fear that many individuals are facing right now. First, a great many people today are afraid of what might happen to them financially. And it's certainly true that great changes are taking place in the economy that will have a direct impact on the lives of millions of people. I've heard it said that a corporation that employs 10,000 men and women today may only need one-fifth that many within 10 years. Over the last 50 years, whole sections of our society have learned to identify with the corporation that employed them. That corporation provided not only a salary, but health benefits and the opportunity to create a pension fund that would make retirement possible at age 65 or even sooner. Now that relationship between the employer and the corporation is changing. Much of the work that used to be done by domestic workers can now be done more cheaply overseas, and companies are taking advantage of that, perhaps out of necessity, perhaps simply to fatten the bottom line. In any case, the fear of losing one's job has now reached a segment of the white-collar workforce that's never been faced with it in quite this way. What else are we afraid of? Many people are concerned about their health. They're afraid that they'll get sick because they're not getting enough exercise or because they're eating the wrong things or because of chemicals in the air or in their food or water. In fact, I think people today are even more frightened of these things than they were in the past when epidemics of disease and poor sanitation were everywhere. And with regard to their health, people are also afraid of the expenses that might result if they were to become sick or disabled or the expenses they might have to bear if this were to happen to a parent or a family member. So financial fears and health-related fears are two of our major concerns. But the third thing that I sense really scares people today is a bit less easy to categorize. It's kind of a general feeling that things aren't as good as they used to be, that there's been a loss of control at some basic level of our society. There's a sense that one earthquake after another, some large and obvious, some smaller and almost imperceptible, have accumulated to shift the foundations of society, and it's going to keep on shifting toward a result that's anything but good. Now, keeping in mind 
Our idea that a courageous person is not someone who never feels fear, but who fears the right thing at the right time in the right way. Let's ask ourselves if these fears really fit that definition. I think if we look a little deeper, we'll see that what really scares people about these situations is the sense that they're going to be helpless, that all their trust was placed in somebody or something, and now they've been let down and they can't do anything. They're helpless. But remember, you're never really helpless. And the sense that you are helpless or that you might be if certain things were to happen is something we really ought to be afraid of and that we should refuse to accept. You're never just a victim of circumstances. No matter what happens, you're never without options that can get you back on track. It takes courage to recognize that because it means accepting responsibility for your own future. But I would suggest that we should accept that responsibility because no one is really going to accept it for us, no matter what we may have been led to believe. Let me emphasize that underlying most fear is the fear of helplessness, of being victimized or being blown around by the winds of fate like a leaf is blown off a tree. But is that really a legitimate way of looking at things? To me, it sounds like being afraid of the dark. In which case, the best thing to do is to get yourself up, out of bed, and switch on the light. After all, the people who built this country didn't feel helpless when they faced obstacles that we can hardly even imagine today. I'm not saying we should all just gather around the campfire and tell stories about George Washington, but we should realize that every generation has faced insecurities and lived with them and triumphed over them. It's only in the past 50 years or so people have come to expect a life without real tough times and real difficulties. But adversity isn't something to fear. It's something to expect, something to prepare for, and something to overcome. The truly courageous person is not immune to fear, but it plays a different role in his or her life than it does for other people. If you're a courageous person, your fears aren't about what someone might do to you or something that might happen to you. Your fears are about not living up to your ideals, about reacting instead of acting, about not taking advantage of the opportunities that are always within reach. A truly courageous person is not afraid of what might or might not happen next week or next year. He fears not making the most of every moment Today, a truly courageous person fears the impulse to dominate other people. She leads by helping others to be their best. A truly courageous person fears making appearances more important than realities. In ancient Greece, the philosopher Demosthenes went searching for an honest man, and he never found one. I've been fortunate. I think I've known a great many honest people. But if I measured that number up against all the less than ethical people I've encountered, I guess I'd have to admit that even in my experience, honesty and integrity are rather rare. Why is that? I hope to provide some answers, but just as our discussion of courage began with a look at fear, I want to start talking about honesty by looking at the exact opposite of honest behavior. There was a time when telling a lie was very serious business. I'm speaking now of the days before lawsuits and legally enforceable contracts. In those days, lying was a very serious matter. It was also very serious if you accuse someone of lying. Today, a breach of integrity in a business matter might mean calling in the lawyers. But for hundreds of years in the past, calling someone a liar was the most common way to provoke a duel, at first with swords, later with pistols. Dishonesty was treated like a personal insult that demanded immediate redress. Everyone knew the big problems that could result if you got caught, so lying to another person took a certain amount of, what's the right word, foolish bravery, maybe. But there's no such risk today, is there? Some people lie all the time without thinking about it. Most people know when they're being lied to, which they may find irritating, but they just accept it. Maybe they decide to become liars themselves. In any case, 
Very few duels are being fought. Lying can get extremely complicated. You've really got to have an outstanding memory to be a good liar because you're always having to create more lies that are consistent with the one you told in the first place. I'm sure we have at some time been caught up in a dilemma like that. Shakespeare had it right all along. What a tangled web we weave when at first we practice to deceive. Maybe you think I'm being a bit tough here. Am I really saying that in every instance you've got to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So if somebody asks me, how are you today? I'm supposed to say, well, I got to be honest with you, I have a sore finger, last night I had a headache, and I've got to admit that my foot hurts a little. No, that's not what I mean. In fact, I think there are many times when some flexibility with the whole truth and nothing but the truth is called for. Outright lying, however, planned lying, lying with an ulterior motive, lying for personal gain, that kind of lying is definitely something to be avoided. But untruthfulness is so tempting today, and I want to spend a little more time on it. I want to make a clear distinction between what I call foolish lying or silly lying or stupid lying and lying that is downright evil and poisonous to the character. Boasting, bombast, blarney, bragging, these are all the same thing. They're always floating around in the atmosphere and they can affect you at any time like catching a cold. They're mostly harmless unless you start building a whole personality around them, which has definitely happened to some people. Some other guy scored the touchdown back in high school, but you're watching the Super Bowl with your neighbor and you say that you did it. That's pretty harmless. You really don't know Joe, the president of XYZ Corporation. You were just introduced to him one time, but the client you're trying to impress has never even shaken hands with Joe. So here's a chance to score some points. That's pretty harmless too. You're not really the creative director of your ad agency, you're the copywriter. But a woman sitting beside you on the plane to Phoenix will never know the difference. It's harmless, unless she walks into your office someday and it's a small world, but you'll chance it. This is all just hot air. I should mention that there's such a thing as boasting in reverse too. People who flaunt their frugality, people who poor mouth, people who are oppressively ostentatious in their lack of ostentation. This is actually becoming a bit more common. Keep an eye out for it. All of this is childish trash talk, and it's usually spontaneous. It comes from succumbing to a moment of social pressure. It's not the kind of behavior that defines strong character, but even strong characters have been known to indulge in it. Ernest Hemingway was a great writer and one of the most powerful personalities of the century, but he could be reckless too. In any case, this kind of bragging and balarney should be distinguished from what I consider real lying. Real lying isn't like putting bills on the credit card. Real lying is like theft. In my opinion, a key element in this kind of real lying is the presence of planning and premeditation. If somebody is a supervisor in a corporation and he steals one of his subordinates ideas and takes credit for it, in the eyes of the CEO, that requires a whole chain of events and a conscious decision to keep the deception going through the various links in the chain. That kind of lying is theft. It's not only theft of the subordinate's idea, it's stealing from the CEO too. It's stealing the CEO's sense of reality. It's creating an illusion. If someone falsifies an earnings report, in order to inflate the price of a company's stock, that's deliberately creating a mirage in the minds of the investors. In the real world, both these examples have happened, and many times, lives and careers have been ruined. It's been my experience that those who engage in serious lying and unethical behavior get caught one way or the other. Usually the people who are being deceived awaken from the illusions that have been foisted upon them. But even if this never happens, the criminal, and I don't think that's too strong a word, 
has to buy into the illusion so deeply himself that his own sense of reality is eroded. By trying to loosen other people's grasp of the truth, you end up losing your own. All of it, small-time lying and big-time deceit. It all comes from fear. Somebody is afraid the truth about themselves isn't good enough, so they depart from the truth. Somebody secretly fears that they can't really come up with ideas of their own, so they steal somebody else's ideas. Or they fear their company isn't really going to succeed, so they come up with a way to inflate the share prices. It's really cowardice. Remember what we said about courage? Courage is fearing the right thing at the right time and in the right way. Fear the temptation to misrepresent who you are or what you've done or intend to do. Trust who you really are. Trust your ability to earn the respect of others. Pay whatever price the truth costs. Pay that bill immediately, because in the long run, it's a real bargain. When you're in a leadership position, whether it's in a business or as the head of a family, honesty and integrity are not as important as money or shelter or a telephone. Honesty and integrity are infinitely more important than any of those things. They're about as important as having air and food and water. For a leader, honesty and integrity are absolutely essential to survival. A lot of business people don't realize how closely they're being watched by their subordinates. Remember when you were a kid in grammar school? How you used to sit there staring at your teacher all day? By the end of the school year, I'll bet you could have done a perfect imitation of all your teacher's mannerisms. I'll bet you were aware of the slightest nuances in your teacher's voice. All the little clues that distinguished levels of meaning that told you the difference between bluff and now I mean business. You were able to do that after eight or nine months of observation. Suppose you had five or ten years. Do you think there would have been anything about your teacher you didn't know? As a manager, there probably isn't anything your people don't know about you right this minute. If you haven't been totally above board and honest with them, it's certain you haven't gotten away with it. But if you've been led to believe that you've gotten away with it, it's most likely because people are afraid of you. That's a problem in its own right. But there's another side of the coin, too. In any organization, people want to believe in their leaders. If you give them reason to trust you, they're not going to go looking for reasons to think otherwise. And they'll be just as perceptive about your positive qualities as they are about the negative ones. I heard a story of a situation that happened some time ago at a company in the Midwest. The wife of a new employee experienced complications in the delivery of a baby. There was a medical bill of more than $10,000, and the health insurance didn't want to cover it. The employee hadn't been on the payroll long enough. The pregnancy was a pre-existing condition, one thing or another. In any case, the employee was desperate. He approached the company CEO and asked him to talk to the insurance people. The CEO agreed, and the next thing the employee knew, the bill was gone. The charges were rescinded. But when he mentioned to some colleagues the way the CEO had so readily used his influence with the insurance company, they just shook their heads and smiled. The CEO had paid the bill out of his own pocket, and everybody knew it no matter how quietly it had been done. An act of dishonesty can't be hidden, and it will instantly undermine the authority of a leader. But an act of integrity is just as obvious to all concerned.